In recent years, Gnosticism has undergone something of a renaissance, with interest and adherence now probably the highest it's been since the late classical period. No doubt this has been spurned on by the fantastic discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, the explosion of literature, both academic and popular, and even Gnostic themes pervading popular culture in films such as the Matrix series, or that Prada ad featuring Thunder Perfect Mind directed by Ridley Scott. Yeah, there's a Prada ad directed by Ridley Scott, like the Alien movies, Ridley Scott featuring Thunder Perfect Mind. So go figure, Gnosticism in popular culture. While certain Gnostic texts such as the Gospel of Thomas, the Apocryphon of John, and the Gospel of Judas, of all things, have rocketed to popularity, as much as obscure religious texts rocket to popularity, other wonderful and insightful Gnostic texts, well, they languish in obscurity. Gnostic text languishing in obscurity, you say? Well, that sounds like a job for Esoterica. So welcome to a Gnostic text double, kind of triple feature. We're going to cover three different Gnostic texts. I want to explore two Valentinian Gnostic texts not found in the Nag Hammadi Library, Ptolemy's Epistle to Flora, which actually explores the Valentinian relationship to the Israelite Mosaic Law found in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, along with a really brief little Gnostic psalm, a Gnostic song of all things, one of the very few to survive from late antiquity. Then we'll fast forward to the 13th century to visit the ever-elusive Cathars as part of our series on Cathar scriptures. Here we'll see the transition from an earlier qualified dualism to an argument for strict dualism of two worlds, one divine and celestial and perfect, and the other our world, you know, satanic, corrupt, sinful, and matter tattering off into non-being. Cathar stuff. Interestingly enough, all three of these texts actually only survive in the very polemical documents meant to combat Gnosticism itself. If you're interested in Gnosticism, Hermetic philosophy, or the academic study of magic, alchemy, or the occult, make sure to subscribe. Check out my numerous other content and curated playlists on topics in esotericism. And if you want to support work like this, providing accessible, scholarly and free, free content here on Topics of Esotericism on YouTube, I'd hope you consider taking a look at my Patreon or maybe consider a one-time donation to support the channel. It's really only possible with your support. You can find those links down below and I really do appreciate your consideration of supporting the project of Esoterica. Now, a Gnostic double feature, triple feature, from the late classical Valentinians to the medieval Cathar dualists. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. While the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, a group of about 52 Gnostic treaties and 13-ish volumes, has revolutionized our understanding of both Gnosticism specifically, but really early Christianity more generally, it's often forgotten that other Gnostic texts survive in other collections, such as the Sakos, the Bruce, and the Askew Codices, but also in the writings of Orthodox polemics against Gnosticism. Among these writers would include Justin Martyr, whose works are unfortunately largely lost, Irenaeus and Hippolytus, and the Panarion, or breadbasket, of Epiphanius, written sometime between 374 and 377. All of these texts function as a kind of encyclopedic attack on a wide range of non-Catholic Christianities, which fell outside of what became known as institutional orthodoxy. 
Luckily, one of the polemical strategies employed by these writers is that of the religious expose, in which they believe that simply spelling out their opponent's beliefs in minute detail would reveal them to be nonsensical, insane even. I say luckily because it more or less means that these polemics actually represent their opponent's positions pretty accurately, up to and including quoting very long sections of the writings that they're opposing in that process. Thus, Gnostic texts, which would have been otherwise lost, have actually survived intact in the writings of some of these anti-Gnostic writers. In fact, I'm sure that they would be rolling in their grave to know that many people actually only turn to their writings now to get at the Gnostic bits, kind of what I'm doing here in this episode. So, I want to turn to two such texts. Thanks, Hippolytus and Epiphanius. I hope you're going to have fun with all the rolling that you're about to do. The first text I want to explore is a very brief Valentinian Gnostic psalm and a commentary on it found in the works attributed to Hippolytus, though there's some controversy if Hippolytus really wrote this. That's a topic for another day. As you might recall from my episode on Valentinian Christianity, you can check out the card above to learn more about this really early and really fascinating form of Christianity, which has unfortunately gone extinct. This species of Christianity was among the earliest and proved endearingly popular, probably lasting until at least the 8th century, as is attested in the Trulin Synod of 692 of the Common Era, at least pretty far out east. Along with his extraordinarily complex cosmogonic myth, Valentinus was also known to have been a very talented writer in general, famously having produced a book of psalms for ritual or liturgical use. Now, as you might imagine, sadly enough, only one of these psalms survived, a very short text known as Theros, or Summer Harvest. Interestingly enough, the title might have actually been the ancient tomb that it was sung to, much like tombs are still sort of recycled and reused with different lyrics, like the ancient tune of green sleeves being used for What Child Is This, the Christmas song. The psalm reads in full, I see in spirit that all are hung, I know in spirit that all are born, flesh hanging from soul, soul clinging to air, air hanging from upper atmosphere, crops rushing forth from the deep, a babe rushing forth from the womb. Of course, this is rather enigmatic, but we're in luck. Right after Hippolytus quotes the psalm, he also provides an anonymous commentary. Now, this could be his own commentary or a further Valentinian exposition. I tend to think that the latter is in fact the case. So we can kind of unpack the esoteric meaning of this psalm. We're told, and it's actually brief enough that I can just quote it in full. Thus, with these words, he means, Valentinus, flesh is the matter which hangs on soul from the creator. Soul clings to air, that is, the creator clings to spirit, which is outside the fullness. Air binds to ether, that is, the external wisdom clings to the internal boundary and the complete fullness. From depth, fruit is born, the father's complete emanation, of the eternities come to be. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this psalm, nor the commentary on it, are the paragon of clarity, but with some background in the Valentinian cosmogenic myth, this isn't totally opaque after all. In fact, the English translation here is hiding a great host of technical Valentinian terms. The term creator there is the craftsperson, the demiurge. The fullness is the pleroma. External wisdom, there in Greek is exosophia, or the divine wisdom fallen outside the fullness, outside the pleroma, though destined to eventually be redeemed. The eternities are the numerous paired syzygies, or aeons in the Greek, which constitute the unfolding of the Valentinian ontology. Again, if you want to learn more about this incredibly complex Valentinian cosmogenic myth, check out my episode on just that topic. But what we have in this psalm is very likely a hymn for liturgical use in the Valentinian church, 
perhaps set to a popular tune of the time, which encodes esoteric references to the deeper cosmogonic system at the very heart of this form of Gnostic Christianity. That's really neat. It's a, a psalm with secret Gnostic messages. In that way, it's a lovely survival displaying just how Valentinius's teachings could survive in complex treaties like the Gospel of Truth, but also in this little ditty like Summer Harvest. Sadly, this is the only Valentinian psalm that survives, but again, we can thank Hippolytus despite his otherwise polemical intentions. In another polemical text, the Panarion or Breadbasket of Epiphanius, which sounds like he wrote it in the Olive Garden, we actually have an entire letter written by a student of Valentinus, Ptolemy, who was active in the second century of the Common Era. This epistle is, interestingly enough, actually addressed to a woman named Flora, one of the few Gnostic women we know of from this time period, who seems to have been a beginning level initiate into the Valentinian church. Her inquiry is about one of the thorniest issues in early Christianity. What do you do about the Mosaic law found in the Hebrew Bible given the salvation accomplished by Christ? Of course, this problem actually goes back to the earliest disputes among Jesus's followers. Ptolemy's answer is interesting because it, one, gives us a glimpse into Gnostic ethics. This is something that is rarely discussed among the piles of cosmogenic speculation, but also because it reveals that the Valentinian position on the Hebrew Bible and the God described therein is actually rather subtle compared to many other Gnostics of the time. Ptolemy argues that the law could have three potential sources. It could come from the divine perfect being, it could come from Satan, or it could come from something intermediate. Now, the idea that the Mosaic law was born directly from the divine is, of course, well, well represented by Judaism. And the opposite position, that it emerged from either the devil or the idiotic abomination of the Demiurge, Yao de Baoth, or one of his other many names, was also current among other Gnostics and, of course, Marcion. The Valentinian position here sails between both of these positions, according to Ptolemy. Here he posits the existence of a divine being below the pure divine goodness, which is actually marked by justice. There's a kind of sub-divinity who isn't good, but is just somehow. The Mosaic Law is the result of that justice divinity, along with adjuncts from Moses himself and the elders of the community who came after him. Further, the law itself can be divided into those sections which are pure and fulfilled by the salvation of Christ, those interwoven with injustice, which are abrogated by Christ, and further symbolic laws which take on a purely spiritual meaning, again, given the salvation of Christ. Given these divisions, what are some examples of how the law works? Well, laws against murder and theft, generally speaking the Ten Commandments, are pure and fulfilled. The lex talionis, or eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth business, are abolished or abrogated. And the kosher laws, sacrificial offerings to festivals such as Passover and circumcision were always really meant to be symbolic according to Ptolemy, but now take on a deeper spiritual meaning. Fasting, if you're curious, was also symbolic to begin with, but continues to be both practical and spiritual as a kind of odd hybrid law. Divorce is actually given as an example of a law which does not follow from pure divinity, but from Moses. Seeing that people were incapable of restraining from extramarital lust, Moses himself instituted divorce as kind of one sin to prevent a worse sin. Of course, Jesus himself taught that marriage can never be abrogated, and the pure divine law forbids divorce as simply lustful adultery. Interestingly enough, this commits Valentinian Gnosticism to the same position as the Orthodox Catholic Church vis-a-vis -vis divorce, as in, nope, never, never divorce. In fact, the overall logic and conclusions of this text are surprisingly similar to positions that both Orthodox Catholic and eventually Protestant Christianity will come to as regards their understanding of the moral, ritual, 
and symbolic dimensions of the Mosaic Law in relationship to the salvation of Christ. Here, Valentinian Gnosticism is really similar to kind of normie Christianity. Further, this analysis also means that the Hebrew Bible and the God revealed in that Bible, that these laws aren't totally demoted and that deity isn't totally demonized as in other Gnostic systems. Thus, the lawgiver God of the Hebrew Bible is, at least in this text, not identified with the horrible demiurge Yaldabaoth, Sakla, Samael, or Azathoth, if you're in a more Lovecraftian mood. Further, we also learn that Flora will eventually learn the more deeper, esoteric, cosmogenic speculations of the Valentinian system at some point in the future, presumably as she is further initiated into the church. Before turning to our Cathar text in this Gnosticism double kind of triple feature, I'd like to offer a word from our sponsor of this episode. We all know how important it is to protect our privacy online and many channels offer discounts for VPN services. But do you ever worry about your very thoughts and prayers being intercepted by the horrible archons which serve as the prison guards of our material universe? If so, you should sign up for Sophia VPN to guard your soul's spiritual transmissions to the divine Pleroma. To sign up, you'll just need to You'll need to travel to 3rd century Alexandria, head over to the Serapium, then go north to the shop of Shimon the Goes. Ask him to sign up for Sophia VPN, and he'll fumigate a personalized silver lamella, which, when worn over your heart, will protect you from the hideous powers and influence of the planetary archons and their leader, the demonic ruler of this realm, Yaldabaoth. Make sure to give Shimon the Goes the discount code special to Esoterica viewers. You can see that discount code on the screen, which will give us the month of Tohuth free. That's a 28 denarii. That's a 28 denarii worth of savings, folks. Again, make sure to give him that discount code you see on the screen. Don't trust your spiritual transmissions to the powers of the Archons. Protect them with Sophia VPN by Shimon the Goes. All right, from late antiquity to the 13th century Southern France and dualist Cathar Christianity we go. As you may recall from my earlier episodes on Catharism, this sect was a dualist variant of Christianity introduced into Central Europe originally, but really took hold in Northern Italy and France, especially in the Languedoc region in Southern France, with its origins probably in the European dualist school known as Bogomilism. Such a dualist religion may indeed even have its roots further back into the Gnostic schools of late antiquity, but there's a lot of debate about this. There's a lot of debate about Catharism in general. While there existed some internal variation, the central core belief was that reality was divided into ontologically distinct good and spiritual and evil and physical camps. Human souls were originally angels tempted out of heaven into the evil physical world by Satan, such that if they don't undergo spiritual purification, they would be caught into a cycle of reincarnation. To achieve salvation, the Cathars had spiritual leaders who led lives of strict purity, the perfecti, who would welcome other believers or supporting them into the life of purity at the end of their lives in the soul Cathar sacrament known as the consolamentum. This ritual would purify the soul such that it could escape the physical body and the physical realm more generally to be reinstated into the purely spiritual angelic realm ruled over by Christ. You may also remember that there's currently a raging debate among medievalists that actually reject this traditional narrative and argue that there were never really any Cathars at all, at least as a kind of institutional counterchurch to the Catholic orthodoxy. Again, you can check out my episode on that debate in the card above. Also, this is part two of a series, probably a three-part series, on Cathar scriptures. You can check out part one up in the card above, again, 
which covers Eastern and more ancient texts which the Cathars felt were authoritative, especially the Ascension of Isaiah and the Secret Supper, sometimes also known as the Questions of John. Now, if you'll remember from the previous episode, the two previous texts that we dealt with were the inheritance of Eastern Bogomilism, which is marked by what we might call qualified dualism, in which, yeah, God and the devil are at war, but that the satanic forces are not totally independent, much less co-divine. What really marks the Cathars off as such is their shift, really starting in Italy and then really finding its ground in France, to a full-blown metaphysical dualism with two distinct realms of good and evil represented by Christ and Satan respectively. The first evidence of such a shift to radical dualism appears in the so-called Manichaean treaties, a topic of this episode, and then later is much more systematically developed in the book of the two principles that'll be the subject of an upcoming episode and kind of wrap up this whole Cathar treatise business. The Manichaean treatise isn't, well, it isn't Manichaean at all. This is actually just an example of how medieval scholastic writers encountered texts or encountered ideas that they considered to be heresy. They felt the need to organize them or categorize them. And to do that, they kind of shoved them into previous typologies found mostly in patristic sources. Folks like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Eponaeus, and Augustine those guys we mentioned earlier. Thus, when faced with medieval metaphysical dualism, they would just categorize it as Manichaean because there was, well, that was the best known dualist system to patristic writers. That was what they were reading, despite the fact that this specific Cathar treatise has nothing to do with the prophet Mani or his religion, which was probably long extinct by the 13th century. Like the Valentinian text we explored in the first part of this episode, this partial treatise only survives as a series of long quotations in the polemical works of Durand of Huesca, himself actually a converted Waldensian heretic, writing sometime around 1222 or 1223, which also gives us a rough idea of when this Cathar text itself was composed. The Waldensians, as you may know, were a heterodox movement marked by a dedication to radical apostolic poverty, something that terrified the church way more than any Fisher-Price metaphysical dualism. Apostolic poverty terrified them. Durand actually would go on to form the Poor Catholics, a kind of Waldensian light movement within the institutional church to combat heresy through polemics and education. Hence this text, the Libro Contra Manichaeus. Interestingly enough, Durand's denotation of the text as Cathar is one of the few times, one of the few times that that term is actually ever used to denote Albigensian Christian dualists. We know them as Cathars, mostly because of 19th century literature, but aside from good Christians or good men, we don't really know what they referred to themselves as, or if they even called themselves anything differently than just Christians. Ditto the Valentinians just thought of themselves as Christians too, not Valentinians or Gnostics, terms which, in fact, were used for them by their theological enemies. Regardless, this Cathar treatise is a fascinating glimpse into the unique form of medieval Christian dualism that we call Cathar. As I mentioned, the text as we have it is preserved in Duran's Liber Contra Manichaeus, and is broken into 19 separate subsections, which articulate and defend a form of Christian dualism, which Durand identifies as the beliefs of the Cathars of southern France, specifically the region of the Languedoc, the traditional heartland of the movement. The anonymous author of the Manichaean treaties is clearly learned, writing in proficient scholastic Latin, and wielding the Vulgate translation of both the Old and New Testaments with honestly deft clarity. In fact, the text can be thought of as a kind of very brief Cathar summa with stated position following stated position in a very clear logical order, all buttressed with a steady stream of proof text brought from the Latin Vulgate. In this way, it seems clear, to me at least, 
that the writer of this text was familiar with scholastic Christianity, employing that method to defend an otherwise heterodox form of Christian dualism. At the heart of the text is an ontological distinction between the all of what is really said to exist and is associated with the spiritual reality and divinity of Christ and the nothing, the nihil, the false world of appearances which comprise this material reality all ruled over, of course, by the forces of Satan. Caught in the middle of this struggle are human beings, us, who are angelic souls trapped in physical bodies. What a bummer. To liberate themselves from this condition, Christ was incarnated in a separate celestial realm, not this one, where he rules and to which the human soul can flee to if, one, it understands this world to be false, that's a Gnostic angle, and two, if they purify themselves from this physical reality and sin, such that upon death the soul can escape to the celestial kingdom of Christ. The genius of this text is how it brings to bear the host of quotations from Jesus, Paul, the apostles, even the Israelite prophets in the Hebrew Bible, to show how the world, this realm, or this physical realm that is fundamentally evil, is in fact ruled over by the forces of Satan. Interestingly enough, the text claims that Christ's incarnation, as I mentioned a moment ago, wasn't into this realm. He never came here, but into a parallel, invisible spiritual realm whereby he created another reality, actually taken from the description given for the end of the world in the Apocalypse of John, to which the pure, the Cathars, will eventually find liberation after death. Indeed, this entire realm, along with its demonic rulers, will be ultimately destroyed in a cosmic conflagration on the Day of Judgment. Take that, Satan. It's also worth noting that this text relies entirely on quotations from the standard medieval Latin Bible in the Vulgate edition and never, never invokes or refers to any other text or tradition, including older dualist texts, that's the ones we covered in the last episode, or those produced in antiquity by the folks that we now know of as the Gnostics. In fact, totally missing are anything like the cosmogenic mythologies found in nearly all ancient Gnostic schools, from the Barbello mythology found in the Sethian form of Gnosticism to the system of syzygies over there with the, the Valentinians. In this way, I think it's completely possible, likely even, that this theology was a more or less indigenous form of Christian dualism, largely, if not totally disconnected from the Gnostic schools of antiquity. Now, that said, some structural homologies do obtain between the two, probably just because of the shared logical conclusions of any form of dualism derived from an overall Christian framework. While we're lucky to have this work at all, sadly we don't know if the text as we have it is complete or to what degree Durand of Heresca actually clip the text as part of his overall polemical agenda. Despite this, this brief text is one of our few precious insights into the world of Cathar theology, revealing it to be as intellectually rigorous and spiritually profound as their enemies, the institutional church, took it to be a dangerous heresy. All in all, these three Gnostic texts are fascinating, spread over centuries, which survive only because they were preserved in the very polemics against them. The cunning of reason, it turns out, has a, a sense of humor in the end. You can consult both the Valentinian text and the really wonderful collection put together by Smith, which also includes the original languages, both Greek and Coptic, on the facing page. The Cathar text preserved by Durand of Huesca can be found in the quintessential a collection of heresies of the high middle ages by Wakefield and Evans. Just, if you're a fan of heresy, you need to have it on your shelf. I'll also include a link in the description to the original Latin text of the Libra Contra Manichaeus, which has been published and translated, although in its entirety, into French 
by Thuzelier. Of course, I'll be wrapping up this series on the Cathar scriptures with an episode on the Book of the Two Principles, no doubt the most sophisticated Cathar text to survive the Inquisition. And again, make sure to travel to ancient Alexandria and sign up for Sophia VPN. Until then, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.